medcram.com. Welcome to another medcram video. Today we're going to talk about a cautionary tale in somebody taking too much vitamin D. I think this case report that was published in the British Medical Journal is illustrative of a couple of things. Number one is what happens when you take too much of a fat-soluble vitamin. Also, why it's important to get levels checked when you start supplementation, and why it's also important to check with your healthcare provider because there are certain conditions that can aggravate high levels of vitamin D. And of course, we'll put a link in the description below to the actual case report so you can look at it for yourself, but let's dive into it. So what we have here is a middle-aged man, and I say middle-aged man because they don't give us his age because of patient confidentiality. And he actually has a pretty significant past medical history. Let's go over that. First notable thing is he has this thing called POT syndrome or mycobacterium bovis in the spine. This is basically like tuberculosis, but it's in the spine. It's not causing a pulmonary issue, but it's causing destruction of the bones in the spine. And that's going to be important later. We're going to talk about why that's important to understand, especially for vitamin D issues. But he also has other issues too. For instance, he's got something called a left ear schwannoma, which is basically a tumor of the myelin sheath of the nerve going to that left ear. He actually had surgery and as a result of that developed hearing loss. Part of that as well is he has something called hydrocephalus, which is basically where there is a increase in pressure in the brain causing an increased volume of water. And for that, you do something called a ventricular peritoneal shunt to try to drain that into the abdomen. And he actually had that, but it doesn't end there. He also had bacterial meningitis. That might have been a result of possibly the surgeries that he had there on the brain. He also had chronic sinusitis. So this is what he had at the start. And if we look at a timeline here as we go across the page, he went to go see a nutritionist. And they recommended a number of supplements, which I'll go over next. You should read these with me because there's quite a number of them. So first of all, the patient had been taking the following daily. Vitamin D, 150,000 international units. So that's a staggering amount of vitamin D. The recommended daily requirement is 400 international units, and he was taking 150,000 international units. And these recommendations that are listed here are from the National Health Service in the UK. But in addition to that, he was also taking vitamin K2, 100 micrograms a day, which is actually at the low end of the daily allowance. And micrograms is written as MCG and also that symbol mu G. Both of those are the same units. He was taking vitamin C, vitamin B9 or folic acid. He's taking about two and a half times the requirement. Vitamin B2, vitamin B6, omega-3. He was actually taking 4,000 milligrams daily when the total daily requirement is only 500 milligrams. He was taking selenium, bioactiver, zinc cholinate, vitamin B3, super 12 complex, lugose iodine drops, borax powder, L-lysine powder. He also had NAC in there as well and acetylcysteine, 600 milligrams he was taking daily. He was taking Wobenzyme, Astaxanthin, soft gel, magnesium malate, but not only magnesium malate, he was also taking magnesium citrate, pure taurine, one to two grams per day, glycine powder, high strength choline with inositol, and calcium orotate, 1,000 milligrams daily, probiotics, glucosamide, and chondroitin complex, and finally, sodium chloride. So we started taking that here right at time zero, but I want to focus in on two of those supplements specifically that he was taking, and one of them is vitamin D. And of course, that's the one that he was taking huge doses of, but also vitamin K2. So both of those are fat-soluble vitamins, and you should know that the fat-soluble vitamins are vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E, and vitamin K. And why it's important to understand what fat-soluble means is that it doesn't wash out of the system. So in other words, if you start taking it, it accumulates in the body fat, and it takes a long time for it to come out of that body fat. So again, he was taking 150,000 international units a day, and the vitamin K2 was 100 micrograms, which is not too bad, actually, per day. 
Well, he started taking this, and after taking it for about a month, he started to develop symptoms. And the symptoms were these. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain, leg cramps, ringing in his ear. Didn't say exactly which ear it was, but he was having ringing in his ear. He had increased thirst, and he had a 28-pound or 13-kilogram weight loss. Now, fortunately for him, when he started getting these symptoms, he immediately stopped taking the supplements. So all in all, these supplements were being taken for about a one-month period of time. Nevertheless, the patient continued to have these symptoms for one month, two months, and even up to three months. So a total of four months after the initial beginning of the supplementation, for three months, the patient had symptoms. So that when he presented to the hospital, three months later after stopping, he had lost the 13 kilograms. Now, of course, when they got a list of the medications that he was taking, they immediately drew labs and put them on intravenous fluids because of the vomiting because he was significantly dehydrated. Let's take a look at the labs that they ordered. Now, this was published in the British Medical Journal with units that we're not used to here in the United States, so I will give both units. First of all, the calcium was 3.9 millimoles per liter. And you should know that normally that should be from 2.2 to 2.6. Now, in terms of units in the United States that we might be more used to, that's 15.6 milligrams per deciliter. And that's normally a range of 8.8 to 10.4. So you can see here clearly that this calcium was very, very high. And essentially, he was experiencing signs and symptoms of hypercalcemia. In terms of his kidney function, it was not optimal. So we measure that with creatinine, and the higher the creatinine, the worse the kidney function. And here it was 166 micromoles per liter, and normally it should be 64 to 106. And in terms of more recognizable units for some of us, that would be 1.9 milligrams per deciliter. And of course, the normal range there is 0.7 to 1.2. The next thing they checked was magnesium. And you remember that he actually was taking magnesium and calcium supplementation. And the magnesium level was 1.04 millimoles per liter. And normal there is 0.7 to 1.0. So just slightly elevated. For more recognizable units for some of us, that would be 2.5 milligrams per deciliter, and the range there is 1.7 to 2.43. Finally, of course, what everyone wants to know is what was the vitamin D levels? Well, unfortunately, it was essentially off the scale. It was greater than 400 nanomoles per liter. You know, normally it should be greater than 50. Some of us use different units. There is nanograms, per milliliter. Nanograms there, even on that scale, that would mean it would be greater than 160, with normal on that scale being greater than 20. Now, we've talked about vitamin D many times before. We actually have a video looking at vitamin D in COVID-19, and the data seems to indicate that you really want to have above 50 nanograms per milliliter. Of course, this person's level was just off the charts. So what's happening here? What actually happened to this patient? You have to understand a little bit about vitamin D metabolism. So there is vitamin D, and vitamin D can come from many different sources. You can have it come from the sun, and that is in the form of ultraviolet B radiation, which goes into the skin and converts a cholesterol derivative into vitamin D, or you can just take it orally as a supplement, which is what this gentleman was doing. And that gives you vitamin D. Well, that vitamin D is pretty much useless because it has to be converted And the way it gets converted is first in the liver to 25-hydroxy vitamin D. That's great, and that's what we actually measure when we measure vitamin D levels. But still, that is not the final end product that we have the active form with. It still needs to be converted in the kidney to the active form, which is 125-dihydroxy vitamin D. And this is the active form here that works so well at causing calcium to be reabsorbed from the gut. 
And that's the important thing to understand here is that this 125 dihydroxy vitamin D is the part that is very well regulated specifically in the kidney. So that if you have a lot of vitamin D, yes, it's fat soluble. Yes, it will stick around in your system. Yes, you'll have a lot of 25 hydroxy vitamin D, but the kidney is where it is regulated to the active form. So you don't get too much of it. The problem is, is that there are certain diseases that will bypass the kidney and make the 125 dihydroxy vitamin D without it being regulated. And what are those things? Things that can make something called granulomas. Granulomas are battlegrounds where your immune system is battling something that is usually a chronic disease, typically a fungus such as coccidiomycosis, histoplasmosis, blastomycosis, tuberculosis. These are immune areas that can be all over the body. It could be sarcoidosis. It could even be in lymphoma. And what happens here in these immune centers is that 25-hydroxy vitamin D gets converted to 125-dihydroxy vitamin D. In people who have granulomas, if they take in, for whatever reason, a lot of 25-hydroxy vitamin D, they are more at risk of getting the complications with high vitamin D levels. In other words, their vitamin D levels don't have to be as high before they get toxicity from hypercalcemia. And that's exactly what happened in this patient, because we go back and look at this patient's past medical history, and we see that they had a granulomatous disease, which is Mycobacterium bovis of the spine. Because of this issue, this patient would be particularly sensitive to vitamin D supplementation. This is interesting because this is not always the case in some conditions. In fact, we know that people with tuberculosis many years ago would be put out into the sun, and actually it would be beneficial and they didn't get issues with hypercalcemia. So it's an interesting example of sometimes where this doesn't always work. But in this case, when you're taking 150,000 international units a day of vitamin D, and you have a condition where you have granulomatous disease, that's going to potentially cause a increase that's far exceeding the normal level of 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. And as a result of that, you're going to have significant issues with hypercalcemia. And that's exactly what we saw here. So what do they do with this patient? They did with this patient what exactly you're supposed to do with somebody with hypercalcemia. And we talk about this at our website, medcram.com, where we actually have instructional information and medical continuing education on how to deal with people with high calcium levels and electrolyte abnormalities. If you have high calcium, what you want to do is give them lots of fluids and that's exactly what they did in this case. Let's take a look what happened when they gave them intravenous fluids. So here is the table one with serial serum electrolyte studies. And you can see here day one of the hospital stay, the calcium levels were extremely high at 3.2. They started the IV fluids and you can see here through day two through day eight, there was a very steady and gradual reduction in calcium concentration. Also notice that the glomerular filtration rate of the kidney started to improve once there was improved hydration because the patient was probably very dehydrated. And similarly, the creatinine improved as well over time. If we look here in table two, you can see here when they tested vitamin D levels in nanomoles per liter, it was greater than 400. They also tested it again on day two, probably because they didn't believe it. Sure enough, it was elevated. Even by the time they got to the end at day seven, it was still elevated. And this illustrates what I was talking about before. You can give IV fluids to these people, but the problem is, is that this is a fat soluble vitamin. It's not gonna wash out. It's gonna stick around for a long time. Notice also that they gave oral bisphosphonate therapy. Now this is a medication that's used to take calcium in the blood and to put it into the bones. It's a great way of trying to reduce calcium concentration quickly, especially when it's that high and the patient is having those type of symptoms. So what happened with follow-up? As it says here, two months later after hospital discharge, so this is now six months after he started taking the supplemental vitamin D. Notice he was seen at an outpatient endocrinology clinic and his corrected serum calcium level had dropped down to 2.6. And that's at the high end of calcium, so it's still elevated, barely. However, the serum vitamin D levels were still off the charts. Again, pointing to this discussion and this idea that fat-soluble vitamins can store up and stay elevated for a long time. And of course, they were going to follow up with the patient to make sure that those levels eventually came down. 
The authors of this study point out as well that vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin in the body along with vitamins A, E, and K. And so those are the vitamins that we actually have to keep track of and make sure that we're not overdosing. And it's the reason why I recommend that if you're going to supplement with vitamin D, you should, after a period of time, get a level checked. So what are the symptoms of too much vitamin D? The manifestations of vitamin D intoxication, the authors say, are often multisystemic and are largely derived from its resultant effects on hypercalcemia. Neuropsychiatric features include drowsiness, confusion, apathy, psychosis, depression, stupor, and finally coma. Possible gastrointestinal features of vitamin D toxicity include anorexia, abdominal pain, vomiting, constipation, peptic ulcers, that's basically like a stomach ulcer, and pancreatitis. Hypertension and arrhythmias such as shortened QT interval, ST segment changes, and bradyarrhythmias encompass cardiovascular signs of vitamin D intoxication. And basically, a QT interval and ST segment changes and bradyarrhythmias are things that you would find on an EKG. If you want more help reading EKGs, don't forget to visit us at medcram.com. We have one of the best EKG courses on the internet. Renal system features of vitamin D intoxication include polyuria, that means peeing a lot, polydipsia, that means drinking a lot, dehydration, hypercalciuria, that means a lot of calcium in the urine, nephrocalcinosis, that means kidney stones, and renal failure. Other features such as keratopathy, and that's a disorder of the cornea, arthralgia, that's basically pain in your joints, and hearing impairment. Interestingly, this guy had hearing impairment as well, or loss, have been reported with vitamin D toxicity. So I want to make sure that everyone understands that I'm not talking about this case because I think that vitamin D supplementation is bad. On the contrary, I supplement myself with vitamin D, but it has to be done in a responsible way and you're making sure that you're checking the level. However, there is a point to be made about people's understanding about supplements and what they might be doing for themselves. And the authors of this study also discuss that here in this paragraph. They say here that Lam et al., which were the authors of another study, discussed that the prevalence of non-prescription medications and dietary supplements among 45 residents at two assisted living facilities in the United States. The authors revealed that the participants used a mean of 3.4 products. So at least three and a half products each were used. Product classes used by residents based on frequency were nutritional supplements, followed by gastrointestinal products, analgesics, herbal products, topical agents, and cough and cold products. The potential misuse of products was detected among over half of these participants. There was duplication in 70%, potential drug disease and food interactions in a fifth of them, and other inappropriate use at 9.1% were misuse patterns documented. Approximately three-quarters of these participants believed that consuming these products helped maintain their health, and nearly 50% of the participants wanted more product information. Almost half the residents received product information from friends and family. Only 40% of these participants turned to their physicians and nurses for information, whereas 11% asked pharmacists for advice. So this is really key here, and you need to understand that just because an over-the-counter nutritional supplement does not need a prescription, it's not harmless, and it can interact with other medications that you may be taking. So I do think this was a good report. Number one, it talks about how things can go bad when you're taking too much vitamin D, how much vitamin D that might have to be but also understanding that there are medical conditions that might not be apparent at first that could interact with some of the supplements that you're taking. And the people that would know that are your healthcare providers. So make sure that when you go to see your primary care provider, you give them a list of your prescription medications. You also give them a list of the supplements that you're taking as well. If you want more information about vitamin D, its uses, its dosing, and the potential side effects, don't forget to watch our video on vitamin D. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to subscribe, turn on notifications, and join us at medcram.com.